Well, folks, welcome to the Art of the Drink class. We're going to learn an awful lot tonight. My name's Anthony Caparelli. This is my assistant, Christy. And we're going to teach you a lot about making drinks. I've been a professional bartender, bar and server instructor, and restaurant owner for over 15 years now. My goal tonight is not to turn you into bartenders, because you can't become a bartender after watching one video. What we want to do tonight is turn you guys into competent mixologists. And I hate that word, but it has sort of a scientific bent to it. And I like that part of it because mixing drinks is an art, but it is also a science. Too many people get concerned with recipes, knowing a lot of recipes. In order to be a good bartender, you have to know a lot of recipes. Well, you know what? You don't. You need technique to be a good bartender. The reason why your drinks at home don't taste like the drinks you get in your favorite restaurant is because your technique is different from what the bartenders are doing in those restaurants. So that's what we're going to focus on tonight. The other thing I'm going to teach you is a lot about the history of the beverages. If you learn the history of liquor, you can learn the history of humanity. It sounds cliche, but it's true. Alcoholic beverages are some of the first beverages that we ever drank. So we're going to talk about that. I know all of you came here for some different reasons, so what I want to do is kind of go around the room, have you introduce yourselves real briefly, and tell me what you hope to get out of tonight's class. So let's start with you. Well, uh, my name is Cooper, and I actually just scored um, a new sales job last week. So I'm excited Good. about that. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks. And, thanks. And I realized that I, I just can't keep serving my, my coworkers and my buddies cheap beer from the fridge. So what I'm actually doing is I'm setting up a home bar. Great. Hopefully Terrific. At, at my place. And I'm going to need to know basics about uh, what liquors I need to buy and mixers and maybe some glassware. Terrific. Great. We'll definitely cover that. My name is Amanda. I just graduated from college. and. Basically, in college, I just had beer and shots, so I don't really know anything about the exchange. <laughs> I, I know that story. I just go there and say, you know, give me your favorite. I don't really know. So I really don't know anything, and I'm looking forward to knowing everything I can about mixed drinks. Sir? My name is David. Um, after attending probably 100 dinner parties and luncheons and cocktail hours and whatnot, uh, I would say I have a very firm foundation when it comes to alcohol and mixing drinks. but. Inevitably, I'll go to a restaurant and I'll hear a friend of mine order a drink that I've never heard of, or worst case, will ask me to make it back at my house. Sure. So uh, I'd like to increase my familiarity, and there's just a lot of nuances to, uh, to alcohol and to mixing drinks that I'm, I'm not familiar with. Sir? Guys, my name is Justin. I've been working in the restaurant business. I've probably waited on you guys one time or another. <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic food. Yeah, I'm a great food guy. But it's kind of only become half the experience. Really, the best thing that I want to do is be able to flesh out that experience and really know the liquor and beverages that my guests want. Mm -hmm. But you know, this I'm hoping will give me that knowledge that I can intelligently talk to them and ask them to get more things for them to the table. Sure, great. I'm Celine. Um, I actually was just elected social chair of my sorority. Congratulations! Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Very excited. Um, so I'm here to learn about. Um, I'll be throwing parties for 200 plus people, so right. I'd like to learn about you know, different kinds of drinks, how to stock a bar to please the right number of people. Um, sure, cost is theme, an issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. cost is an issue, and, you know, theme parties. Sure. Take as much as I can. Yeah. Great, great. Ma'am? Hello, I'm Tiffany, and I'm often going to business meetings and dinners and things like that, business functions, and I don't know alcohol beverages. I just order wine because I don't know drinks. I'm not sure I feel very adequate in that area, and I want to learn. I want to be in the know. <laughs> I can advance my career. Terrific. Well, we're going to hit all the topics that you brought up this evening. I think the things that you folks mentioned just now represent the average person's experience when they come to a bar. One of the things that I want to focus on tonight is to demystify the bar. To a lot of folks, they get the impression, I've heard this story a lot, that Sometime in their life, somewhere, there was a secret meeting. And at that meeting, folks learned how to order drinks. They learned the difference between vodka and <laughs> gin. They learned when to order red wine, when to order white wine, what everything meant that people were saying when they went up to a bartender. For some reason, they feel like they missed that meeting. They weren't at that meeting. They didn't get that class. Well, folks, this is that class. So by the end of the night, not only will you be able to host parties, make terrific drinks that taste just like the drinks that your favorite bartenders make you, or better, hopefully. <laughs> but you're also going to know what you're talking about. You're going to be confident when you're in a group, when you're going into a bar, whether it's for business, whether it's for pleasure, whatever. You're going to know what it is that the bartender is talking about. You're going to be more intelligent, and you're going to be able to order drinks that you like, that are appropriate for the occasion, and you're going to be a better bar customer, as well as a better mixologist when you get home. 
Sounds good? Sounds good? Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, let's get started. Okay, folks, so what we've done is I've turned this bar around magically. It's one of my favorite things about this bar. So that you can see what the bartender is seeing when you come up to the front of the bar. Everything about bartending revolves around speed. Okay, you want to be able to put drinks up properly, but you want to also be able to put them up quickly. So if all bars are set up in a similar fashion, you can go from bar to bar and you're going to know where to find things right off the bat. But when you're setting up your home bar, I want you to pay attention to this because you should try and mimic this as much as possible. The most important thing and the most obvious thing that you see at the bar is what's called the speed rail. The speed rail should always be set up in the same order. Chrissy, why don't you tell us what that order is? Vodka, gin, rum, tequila, triple sec, lime juice, grenadine, dry vermouth, sweet vermouth, and whiskey. Speed rail or the well liquors. The reason that they're called the well liquors is because right above it, we have our ice well. Justin, you have a question? Yeah. When I go to a table every time, if the customer wants the base drink that we have, they're always asking for, I'll take the well liquor, you know, I'll right. take whatever you got on hand. Is that always well synonymous with the cheapest liquor? Yes, it is. The reason that I said that the speed rail is also called the well liquors or the well rail, as I said, it's right below the ice well. And this is where the bartender is going to put the liquors that they want to serve the most of. So they're house brands. And those are usually going to be the least expensive. Okay. So they're also called rail liquors or house liquors. So when you're going to a restaurant, if you order a well drink, a rail drink, or a house drink, you're going to get the same thing. You're going to get usually the least expensive brand of liquor that they carry, and they're going to keep it in this well right here so it's the most accessible to the bartender. Okay? Again, call the well because it's right below the ice well. Now, the ice well is the heart and soul of every beverage station. The beverage station is where the bartender is going to stand, and they should be able to make 90% of their drinks standing in front of that ice well without moving in a well-set-up bar. And again, that's something that the folks that are setting up a home bar want to keep in mind. Make sure that you have everything within arm's reach. So, focusing around the ice well. Something else I want to point out, scoop in the ice well. I want everyone to go out and buy one of these <laughs> ice scoops. I would have forgotten. Okay? So my spoon's not going to work. Your spoon is not going to work. <laughs> Christy, why do we need an ice scoop? Sanitation. Sanitation, exactly. Two reasons. One, never, ever, ever put glasses in the ice. Christy, why don't we ever want to put glass around the ice? Because it will break and get all in your ice. Exactly. Even if it doesn't break, you might say, well, if it breaks, I'll know that it broke and I just won't serve it. It could chip and you could end up with chips in the ice. That's very, very dangerous. So you never want to do that. Also, you don't want to put your dirty hands in the ice or someone's dirty cup in the ice. I can't tell you how many parties I go to, right, where in the ice well is what? A cup. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got a cup sitting in there and they're using that to serve ice. Please don't do that. Go out, get yourself a nice ice scoop, and use the ice scoop. All right. Next to the ice well, we have our juices in these nifty little containers. Now, you don't need these to set up a home bar. You will find them in almost every restaurant, and there's a lot of good reasons why. And if you have a couple extra bucks, it's a good idea to go out and get a set of these. They're not very expensive. What are these called? Storm pours. Storm pours, right. Store and pours because you can take the, the pour spout off and put a lid on here and you can store the juices and then you can screw this right back in. Probably easy for cleaning too. Much easier to clean, okay, and you can keep your juices that way. The other nice thing about these is you can free pour out of them, which we're going to talk about later. One of the things that you're going to see bartenders, I'm sure you've all seen them do, is they pour the liquor right into the drinks and they always seem to be able to get the exact amount in the drinks without using a measuring cup. That's called free pouring. I'm going to teach you how to do that. You can do it with these. Difficult to do out of a half gallon of orange juice. Okay, so we have our juices. In most bars, and definitely in a basic home bar, the main juices that you're going to want are orange juice, sweet and sour mix, cranberry juice. You're also going to want pineapple juice and grapefruit juice. Okay, so if you have those basic juices, that will allow you to get 95% of the drinks made that people may want when they come to your house. Okay, moving on, we have our garnish tray. Lemons, oranges, limes, maraschino cherries, and olives. Now, this bad boy is usually on the front of the bar, and this is called a caddy, a straw caddy. And it does exactly what the name says, it holds the straws. You have straws and you have stirrers, and people often get these confused. Okay, a straw is to drink out of, and a stirrer is to stir your beverage with. 
Yes, Lee. So is it considered uncool to drink out of a stir? <laughs> I see a lot of people drinking out of stirs, and I do it all the time. I, I, all I, the time. I don't yeah. Know. But yeah, it is kind of uncool. <laughs> <laughs> it's really to stir your drinks with. You can drink with them, and some bartenders will give you two in a drink to make it a little easier. These are drink mats. You've probably all seen them before. They serve a very important purpose, and their main function is to catch spills. While you're making drinks, anything that sloshes out of the drink gets caught in the drink mat. Last but not least, your shaker set. This is, again, on your must-have list. Right after you buy your ice scoop, I want you to go out and get a shaker set. And a shaker set consists of three pieces. This is the tin, this is the glass, and this is the strainer. You need all three to make drinks, and I'm going to show you how to use all three of them. Okay, so we've turned the bar back around, and this is the way you would normally see it if you would come up and order a drink. What are all those bottles back there? First thing you need to know that this part of the bar is called the back bar. These liquor bottles back here are what's called the call liquor bottles. Remember I told you that in the well are generally the liquors that are the least expensive liquors in any given bar. If you want something more expensive than that, it's going to generally be on the back bar, or what used to be called the top shelf. Now, I'm sure you've all heard the term top shelf margarita. That's where it comes from. If you wanted a margarita made with tequila that was more expensive than what the restaurant was serving in their rail, in their speed rail, you would call it out, and you would usually call for one of the tequilas that was on the top shelf. So that's where the terms call and top shelf come from. And all they mean is, I want something that's a little better than what you may be serving out of your drink rail. So everything at the restaurant is trying to sell you that's going to be a name brand alcohol that's going to cost you a little bit more and is probably a little bit better quality is going to be on the back bar, on the top shelf, and you're going to need to call it if that's what you want poured into your drink. Celine, did you have another question? Yes. So if I wanted to order one of the back bar liquors, I wouldn't say I'd like a back bar Cosmo. No, you wouldn't. I'd say, even if there's no top shelf, I'd say I'd like a top shelf. Yep. Top shelf has come to mean, give me the brand that's better than your well brand. I was wondering why all the glasses are shaped as they are. Good question. That's the last thing that you see behind me is a lot of glassware. So I'm going to have Christy bring up each of the different types of glasses, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Christy, what are we starting with? The rocks glass. A rocks glass. Terrific. Now, rocks, we've heard that a lot. That's some, some bar slang that we're going to, mm -hmm. one of those things that we're going to demystify for you. What are rocks? Rocks are simply ice. Simply <laughs> ice cubes, exactly. It's bar speak for ice cubes. So what do you think goes in a rocks glass, first of all? Ice. Ice, ice exactly. <laughs> this is probably what David drinks a lot of drinks out of. You're a scotch drinker, yes? Yes, I am. Terrific. So generally, drinks that do not have mixers in them that are served by themselves or straight will be served in a rocks glass because there's only room for ice and liquid. Next glass we have? The mixed glass. The mixed glass. And you can tell that there's a pattern here. The rocks glass held ice and the mixed glass mm -hmm. is for making what types of drinks do you think? Mix. Mix. Mixed drinks. Mixed drinks, exactly. <laughs> and a mixed drink is very simply an alcoholic beverage mixed with a non-alcoholic beverage, right? So again, you can see it's a little bigger, so there's now room for the ice the liquor, and the mixer. Next drink we have? The brandy snifter. The brandy snifter. What do you think goes in the brandy snifter? Brandy. Brandy. Oh, brandy. brandy. Right. <laughs> the brandy snifter is the first glass that actually, that we're looking at that actually has a specific method behind its design. It's specifically designed so that you can hold it in the palm of your hand and the heat from your hand will warm the brandy. And that does a couple of things. The most important thing that it does is any liquid, the warmer it gets, the more it volatilizes, which means the more it starts to evaporate. And when it evaporates, you can smell it better. Now, you can serve other drinks in this, but it's really designed for brandies and cognacs. Next glass we have. It's a tall glass. A tall glass for tall drinks. Now, a tall drink is just a, a regular mixed drink that has more non-alcoholic mixer than normal. So, if I wanted, oh, let's say, what's your favorite mixed drink? Cape Cod. Cape Cod, which is what? Vodka and cranberry. Vodka and cranberry. If I wanted a Cape Cod, you'd make it in this glass. Yes. If I asked you for a Cape Cod tall, you'd make it in this glass, right? Yes. Very simple. You're going to have more cranberry juice, 
Same amount of alcohol. So if I were to order a double, would it be served in a tall glass or would it be served in just a mixed drink glass? If you were to order a double Cape Cod, for example, they would probably serve it to you in a tall glass because they would need the room to add twice the amount of liquor. If you were to order a double scotch, for example, instead of serving it in a rocks glass, they would probably just serve it in a mixed glass because they don't need the room for the mixer. All right? Next glass we have, Christine. A wine glass. A wine glass. Now, there's all different types of wine glasses. This is a standard wine glass. The thing that you need to know about wine glasses, both as someone who's going to host parties and pour drinks, as well as someone who's going to go to a restaurant and purchase drinks, is that wine glasses are only designed to be about halfway filled. So if you go to a restaurant and they only fill it to about here, that is right. Don't send it back. Please, <laughs> please remember that, okay? I bet Justin has a lot of stories about that. I can't take that anymore. Now, there's a real good reason for that. One of the things that you will learn, hopefully, as, as we talk more about beverages, is your tongue can only actually taste four different tastes. Does anybody know what they are? Sweet, sweet, sour, sweet, sour, bitter, bitter, spicy, salty. close, salty, salty. Ah. sweet, sour, bitter, and salt. That's the only four flavors that your tongue can taste. Everything else that you have ever tasted in your life, you've actually smelled. Believe it or not. Okay? So, when you get to the point where you start to enjoy alcoholic beverages more like a fine food, which is the way I encourage you to enjoy them, nothing against doing shots. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But when you start to appreciate the tastes and start to learn how to create cocktails yourself, you're going to want to appreciate them on a lot of different levels. And it's very, very important that you get the smell as well as the taste. So when I fill a wine glass, for example, only halfway, or when I fill a brandy snifter, just to the fattest part of the bell, all of the vapor that's coming up off of the drink gets contained by the rest of the glass, so that when you bring it to your mouth, you smell it first and taste it second. Okay, next glass that we have. The champagne flute. The champagne flute. What goes in this? Champagne. 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 <laughs> Pretty simple. Champagne. Is there a certain limit on how much champagne you should put in the glass as a wine glass? Champagne, actually, it's traditional to fill right to the top of the flutes. And the flutes are these uh, beveled ridges in the side of the glass. And as you can see, they go up to about a half inch below the rim. So when you're pouring champagne, you actually do fill it to the top. The reason for that is that champagne bubbles, and the bubbles do the job of carrying the smell of, and the nose of the champagne to your nose. How is alcohol made? Is it, is it purified, or where does it come from? Where does alcohol come from? Christy? Fermentation. Fermentation. We've all heard of fermentation. It's a natural process and it is caused by yeast. Just like when we make bread. Yeast. Yeast is a plant and it does one thing and it does it very well. It converts sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. It takes in sugar and it excretes alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's what it does. It breaks down sugars. So, that is where we get a particular type of alcohol called ethyl alcohol or ethanol, and that's the alcohol that we drink. It all comes from yeast. The first drink that most people take in their lives is generally not a very pleasant experience. Alcohol does not taste very good, and that's one of the reasons why bartenders are in such high demand, because they can make alcohol taste good. But it does beg the question, why do we even drink it to begin with? And the answer, I think, is really, really interesting. Alcohol does a couple things. The one that we're most familiar with, alcohol is a drug, let's face it. We all need to think of it as a drug and we need to treat it as a drug so that we can drink responsibly. And we're going to talk a lot about that. So it is an intoxicant. It's, an, it's a depressant specifically. The other thing that alcohol does is it's a preservative. So way back in the day, before we had nice things like municipal water supplies, and you couldn't just go to your sink and turn on the faucet and get nice, clean, fresh, chlorinated water that was free of bacteria, your only choice was to go out into the river, which generally 
was an open cesspool because that's where all the streets yeah. ran to, right? And what did we throw in the streets back in the day? All of our waste. So if you wanted to drink out of the river, you could, but who knows what you're going to get. Your other option was to drink a beverage that was preserved with alcohol. Now, when you, if any of you do any home brewing, you may know it's kind of difficult to make beer that tastes good. The one thing that we do know, though, is it's impossible to make beer that will harm you. We've not found any pathogens that can survive in an alcoholic beverages. It's, it's a natural preservative. So as people evolved, the one thing that they knew is that if the beverage was fermented, it was not going to make them sick. So that's why we drink alcohol. For thousands of years, our only choice was to drink something like beer or mead or cider or wine. Preserve the liquid, okay? And if you wanted to get through the winter, that's what you drank. So how is liquor different from beer? How are liquor different? Well, we talked about fermentation, right? Fermentation is simply taking a sugar solution, adding yeast to it, and letting the yeast do its thing. You can do that with a lot of different things. The most common fermented beverages that we drink in this culture are beer and wine. And beer is made from malted barley that they add water to and yeast and you let it ferment and you have beer. Simple as that. Wine, you do the same thing with grape juice. Now, if you want liquor, what do we know? That, how is liquor different from beer and wine? It's stronger than beer and wine. It's more concentrated than beer and wine. Christy, how do we make liquor from a fermented beverage? Distillation. Distillation is how you get liquor from a fermented beverage. And distillation is based on what? The difference in boiling points. The difference in boiling points between two liquids. So here's the problem. Let's say you want to preserve this wonderful crop of grape juice that you harvested and worked real hard to get. So you let it ferment and now you have wine, which will last years and years and years. You realize that when you drink the wine, it makes you feel really, really good. And that's because of the alcohol in the wine. Well, now you want something a little stronger. Unfortunately, yeast dies once the alcohol concentration gets to a certain level. So if you want anything stronger than the natural environment that yeast will live in, you have to separate the alcohol out yourself. And you do that based on the most obvious difference between alcohol and water, and that's their difference in boiling points. Water boils at about 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, and alcohol boils at about 173 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. So if I take a mixture of alcohol and water and heat it up to about 175 degrees, the alcohol will boil off and the water will not. If I capture the vapor and cool it back down to a liquid state, I now have alcohol. And the water stays liquid in the pot. And that's what a still does. Now, has anyone ever, you've all seen stills? Has anyone seen stills? You probably have, even if you don't know. It's a big pot over a Bunsen burner that has a cone-shaped top to it and then a copper coil coming off, dripping down into another vessel. You heat the alcohol and, and water mixture in the pot, the cone captures the alcohol vapor, the copper cools it back down, and what drips out the end is grain alcohol or pure ethanol. All of your base liquors are all 80 proof. 80 proof is 40% alcohol. Okay, so you take whatever the proof is, you cut it in half, that's the alcohol percent by volume. Little story behind that, back in the day, when the government needed money right after the Revolutionary War, they decided they were gonna tax alcohol, even though the, the entire Revolutionary War was fought against taxes. <laughs> when you're left with a big war bill, you gotta do something, right? So they decided they were gonna tax alcohol, easiest thing to do. Well, they had to prove that they were actually taxing alcohol and not water or juice or something else. You had to actually prove to the, to the taxpayer that it was alcohol. There was no way to do that. There was no chemistry labs back in the day. So what they did was they capitalized on the fact that alcohol will burn. And a mixture of alcohol and water will burn as long as it's at least 50% alcohol. What they would do, they would take a little spoon, put a little gunpowder in it, take the liquid in question, pour it into the spoon, and try and light it. If it lit, it meant it was at least 50% alcohol, and therefore it was 100% proven that it was taxable. So 50% alcohol, 100 proof.
bars. I hear people using terms to order drinks like straight up or dry or on the rocks. I learned that with ice or dirty. What, what do those mean? Let's talk a little bit about some of the bar terminology. Chris, you already told us that rocks mean ice. I'm going to go through real quickly some of the things that you may hear in a bar so that you'll know what you're talking about and the way to order drinks properly. So the first one, obviously, we talked about was rocks. One of the other ones that you said was straight up. Straight up, straight up you, you normally hear those two terms combined. They're actually separate terms. Straight just means don't mix it with anything. So for example, we talked about Dave's father-in-law drinking scotch, drinking it straight. Now he may drink it straight on the rocks, or he may drink it straight up. And up means no rocks. Now generally, up also implies that they want it chilled and then have it strained off the rocks into a glass with no ice. If they want it straight but not chilled, they'll generally ask for neat. And neat usually means right from the bottle into the glass. And those are some of the bar terms that you may hear and not have known what they meant. You also mentioned dirty. Dirty is specifically for martinis. When you order a martini dirty, it means put some of the olive juice from the garnish tray into the drink. Add olive juice into the drink for the martini. What does dry mean? Dry very simply means less vermouth. So if I'm looking at, let's say, a gin martini, dry means less sweet in beverage talk. That's all it means, less sweet. So when I decrease the amount of sweet ingredients, I make the drink drier. So if I were to take a regular martini and ask for it dry, it just means take less vermouth. I take less vermouth. If I ask for it extra dry, it means no vermouth at all, please. Now, in a Manhattan, because we are using sweet vermouth instead of dry vermouth, it means something a little different. If I ask for a dry Manhattan, it means please use dry vermouth instead of sweet vermouth. Okay. The last thing your guests may ask you is for a perfect Manhattan. Perfect means half sweet vermouth and half dry vermouth. I can go ahead with the difference between beers and wine and everything, but I don't always work. I was actually taking a nice looking girl because I'm a nice looking guy. I like to <laughs> out last night and she ordered a liqueur. <laughs> I know what liquor is. I've had, I order that all the time, but a liqueur, I don't know, maybe you know, maybe you know, but Christy, you got to help me here. <laughs> Next time I don't want to look stupid on a date when she orders a liqueur and I'm thinking, oh great, she's drinking tequila. <laughs> A liqueur is actually a cordial, and it is a low-alcohol, high-sugar drink. Right. That's exactly right. Liqueurs and cordials, <laughs> generally the same thing. There are things like Bailey's Irish Cream, Amaretto, Chambord. They have lower alcohol than, let's say, vodka, usually about half as much alcohol. And they have a lot more flavor, usually some sugar added back in. And they're usually meant to be drunk alone. You have about five basic drink types. The first one is going to be a rocks drink, which is just a straight drink, either on the rocks or if it's, as I said, it can be chilled and served up, but it's just a straight shot of liquor. The next type of drink you have is called a mixed drink, and a mixed drink is usually going to be liquor served with either soda or juice or some type of mixer. Then you have martinis, and today martinis are any drink that's served up in a martini glass. Remember, up means chilled and strained into a martini glass. You also have tropical drinks and frozen drinks. Tropical drinks are usually served in larger glasses. They usually have multiple liquors in them, multiple mixers in them, generally a lot of fruit. And frozen drinks are served on the rocks in a blender. They're blended up and served so that they come out like a slushy or a smoothie. Well, I want to give this a try. Are we going to get a chance to make some drinks? Yes, we yeah. are. You guys ready to do that? Good. Now, before we get into that, I want to show you a couple of terms that you need to know so that when I show you how to make the drink, you know what I'm telling you to do. Now, we've all watched James Bond, right? How does James Bond take his martinis? Shaken, Shaken not, not stirred. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> Great. Now, there's a difference between the two, obviously, or he wouldn't bother specifying it. When I say shaken, when I ask you to shake a drink, I want you to take the tin and the glass and you're going to put them together and you're going to shake. When I ask you to shake a drink, I want you to shake the drink vigorously. When I ask you to stir the drink, normally what that means is you would take a bar spoon and just stir the drink in the tin. We don't do that a lot because it takes a lot of time. 
Normally, instead of stirring, we'll do what we call rolling, which means you will take the drink from the tin, pour it into the glass, which stirs it, and then pour it back into the tin, and it's ready to be served. The technique for building the drink is as important or sometimes more important than the ingredients that you put in the drink. You can have the best cut of steak in the world and if you don't cook it properly it's going to taste terrible. You can have an awful cut of steak and if you cook it properly it can taste great. Same thing with drinks. So when I ask you to shake a drink it's for a reason. It does several things. One, it mixes the ingredients which is important. Two, it aerates the drink. By aerating the drink, it allows your nose to get involved, right? We talked about how important that was. When you shake the drink, some of the liquid starts to evaporate in the bubbles, and it allows your nose to smell the drink before you taste it. And even as you're drinking the drink, the bubbles are popping in your mouth and carrying all that flavor up your nasal passages into your nose. So it intensifies the flavor of the drink. It also changes the texture of the drink. It can make it nice and frothy. So it's very, very important to make the drink properly. There are some drinks that you definitely want to shake, and there are some drinks that you definitely do not want to shake. I'm going to take a couple seconds to just show you some basic drink building techniques, and then I'm going to have you guys come up and make some drinks. Right. First thing you need to know, when to build a drink in a glass, and when to build a drink in the tin. For the first drink that I make, it's going to be a screwdriver. What's a screwdriver? Vodka orange juice. Vodka orange juice. Very easy. Rule of thumb. Drinks that are served on the rocks are built in the glass. Drinks that are served up are built in the tin. Just a rule of thumb, not always true, usually is. So, for a screwdriver, I'm going to go ahead and build it in the glass. First thing you want to do, make sure your glass is clean. That's very important. Set your glass on the drink tray, and I want you to fill it all the way with ice. The number one thing that I see people do in home bars that's different from what the professionals do is they don't use enough ice. You've all seen the poster of the mint julep or the iced tea that has three nice pretty ice cubes floating in it, and that's all. Looks great in a picture, doesn't work in real life. So, ice is your cheapest mixer. It also makes sure the drink is served at the right temperature. Again, like steak or soup or anything else that you order in a restaurant, temperature is just as important with drinks as it is with food. It needs to be served at the right temperature. So, fill it with ice all the way, always. Next thing you're gonna do, is liquor. So far we have glass, ice, liquor. Now the liquor I'm going to free pour, I'm going to do it first and then explain it to you. Liquor always goes in right over the ice. Now when I free pour, I want you to watch a couple things. One, when I hold the bottle, I always wrap my finger around the pour spout. Don't ever hold the bottle like this. You look like a rookie and the pour spout's going to come off, ruin your carpet. So hold it like this. The next thing that I do, when I turn the bottle over, I bring it to what's called a 10 o'clock position. So when I actually start the pour, the bottle, if you can see, if there was a clock there, the bottle is pointing towards 10 o'clock. That makes sure that the pour spout is pointed directly down and the liquid comes out at the same speed every single time you pour. The next thing that I do is count. One, two, three. That is an ounce and a half. With this particular type of pour spout, that is one and a half ounces. So each count is a half ounce. When you go buy your pour spouts, and I know you will, I want you to go home and pour into measuring cups a couple times so that you find out what your count is with your pour spout. When you get this technique right, it is more accurate than using a measuring cup or a jigger. The other important part of the count is the cutoff. And I do what's called a drop cutoff. So watch when I'm done pouring, I don't simply just turn the bottle, I actually drop the bottle. That catches the liquid in the spout and makes sure that when I'm done pouring, no more dribbles out. So watch, this is called a long pour. I'm going to take it real high up off the tin and then I'm going to do a drop cutoff. So one, two, watch the flow, stops. Okay, that's the correct technique for pouring. A standard shot is an ounce and a quarter. The next thing I do is I take my non-alcoholic mixer, which in this case is orange juice, and watch my pour technique out of store and pour, turn it over, get a nice flow, 
And then when I'm ready to stop, I'm gonna do a drop pour and catch that liquid in the air and it cuts off. Make sure you fill the glass all the way to the top. Roll the drink into the tin and back into the glassware. Never serve an unmixed drink. At that point, take a stir, because it's uh, not a tall glass, and my garnish. Garnish the drink, put it out on a cocktail napkin. Drink's all set. Very simple drink. Next thing I'm gonna show you is a martini. A martinis are served up in a martini glass, which means they're built in the tin. Same basic order. I have my tin, full scoop of ice. The two liquors in a martini are vodka and dry vermouth. And dry vermouth is actually an Italian wine. For a standard martini, I'm gonna put an ounce and a half of vodka in the tin first. Same pour with a three count and a good cutoff. And then I'm going to add a half ounce of vermouth, and a half ounce of vermouth is a one count. Now I'm going to take the glass, marry it to the tin, twist it slightly to make sure that it's in there and is not going to leak. Now the most important part of making a martini is I'm going to shake it. And when I shake a martini, I really shake a martini. Never undershake a martini, and that means martinis, Manhattans, Gibsons, Gimlets, Cosmos, you name it. Now how do I know when to stop shaking the martini? Christy? When it's frosty on the outside. When you can frost, and you can feel it frost under your fingers, and you can see, if I run my finger down the side, there's actual frost on the tin. Now there's a reason for that. Remember I talked about how the boiling points of water and alcohol were different? Well, the freezing points are different too. That's why alcohol is used in antifreeze. So, the liquid in this glass, which is alcohol and water mixed, now actually freezes at a temperature lower than water, which is what this frost is. This frost is freezing at zero degrees Celsius. The liquid in the glass is now lower than that because the alcohol allows it to drop below the freezing point of water. Now I know this is at the right temperature. To take this off, please don't bang it on the bar. I see people do that all the time. The other thing that they do, which seems to make sense, is they will pull it this way. They'll pull it away from the direction that it's bent, and all that does is jam it in harder. To get it out the first time, every time, either pull it the direction that it's already leaning, or pull it a little bit sideways, and it will come out first time, every time. Now I take the strainer, Strainer's really easy to operate. Finger goes on that little lip, and you can control the flow by moving your finger up and down. And you pour it into your glass. Perfect martini. Now, standard garnish for a martini, two olives. And when you garnish a drink, especially a drink like this, I always want you to place the garnish on the pick so that one olive is in the drink and one olive is out of the drink. Garnishes always need to do two things. They need to make the drink look better, and they need to make the drink taste better. So, if both of those olives are out of the drink, all it's doing is making it look better. If both of those olives are in the drink, all it's doing is making it taste better. Okay, we're gonna make some drinks. All right. Ready to make some drinks? Ready. Fantastic. I'm gonna take you through each of the liquors. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the liquors. Okay, the first thing, the czar of liquors, vodka. Vodka is made from what? Potatoes. Potatoes, no. A lot of people think vodka is made from potatoes. That's what my mom told me. It can be made from potatoes. Actually, it can actually be made from potatoes. Some of the world's finest vodkas are made from potatoes. Generally, vodka is made from grains. It's called a grain neutral spirit. Vodka is made from, you, you mash up grains, you ferment them, and then you distill them. You take one final step, which is you filter them through charcoal, and that neutralizes the spirit. So vodka is what's generally considered to be odorless and tasteless. Not really true. It tastes and smells like alcohol. But it's pretty pure alcohol. Classic vodka drink. 
vodka martini. Now you saw me make one, and Dave, why don't you come up, and we'll have you make one. Scoop of ice in your tin. You give me a three count of vodka. Good, a little short, not bad. Go ahead and give me a one count of dry vermouth. Yep. And one, perfect. Go ahead and marry your glass to your tin. Where's my tin? Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, give it a shake. Don't stop shaking until you feel that frost form under your fingers. All right. If you shake hard enough, you'll actually feel it put your fingers off the tin. You can see it, too. You can actually see it. More. <laughs> yeah. You got it? I Just go ahead and stop and check. Give, give it the fingernail check. Looks pretty yeah. good. Okay. Woo. And pull towards me. You want to pull towards it in the you. direction it's leaning. There Yay. you go. Yay. Fantastic. Turn it upside down so it drains. There you go. Okay. And your strainer. And go ahead and pour. All right. There you go. Fantastic. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. And don't forget the garnish. Two olives. That Why is a nice spot for martini. Thank you very much. Good job. 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 Next liquor we're going to talk about is gin. Gin is very similar to vodka, except instead of being neutralized, it is infused with certain herbs and spices, most notably juniper, which is why it smells like a Christmas tree. It's also where it gets its name from. Gin is a shortened version of the Dutch word Jennifer, which means juniper. The most famous gin drink is the gin and tonic, mixed with tonic water. Tonic water is just soda water that has quinine in it. And quinine is actually a poison. It gives it that bitter taste. The reason that they used to mix gin and tonic back in the day when the English were out conquering the world, most notably India, they had some problems with malaria. And they thought that, it, that quinine would cure malaria, but quinine tasted terrible. So they would mix it with soda water and add gin to make it taste better and then squeeze in a little bit of lime because that's what they had around in India and that's the origin of the gin and tonic. Oh, there you go. The reason it's called tonic is because they thought it was a health tonic that you took in order to cure malaria. They were wrong, but they had a good time. So <laughs> let's make a gin gimlet. Right. And a gimlet is a type of martini. Amanda, why don't you come up? We're going to build it in a martini glass. And a gimlet is just vodka or gin. And instead of dry vermouth, which is what you put in a martini, you add lime juice. So go ahead and set your glassware. And Christy will hand you your ingredients. Go ahead and take your tin. Okay. Nice big scoop of ice in the tin. <laughs> Terrific. And I want to see a three count of gin. Okay. Yep. Two, two, three. Very nice. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and your Rose's lime juice. Okay. Perfect. All right. Nice job. All right. Go ahead and put your glass in. Marry your glass. And let's see the shake. <laughs> <laughs> the most important part is making a good martini drink. <laughs> Frosting yet? I think so. I think so. Good. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Good? That's okay. good. All right, nice work. Strainer. Almost forgot. Almost forgot the strainer. <laughs> nice work. Perfect. And the garnish on a gimlet is a lime wedge. Put it right on the glass. Good job. Yay. All right. The next liquor we're going to talk about is rum. Rum comes from the Caribbean. The reason that rum comes from the Caribbean has to do with what rum is made from. Molasses or sugarcane syrup. Makes sense. That's what they had a lot of in the Caribbean. Yeah. This is why I was saying that a history of liquor is a history of mankind. 
If you notice what we've talked about so far, the liquors made from the products that were indigenous to the place where the people drank the liquor. So in this case, they had a lot of sugar cane. That's what the plantations were harvesting. Byproduct of making sugar is molasses and sugar cane syrup. They would let those ferment and then they would distill them. You would end up with rum. You can also age rum, and if you've ever seen dark rums, you can actually put rum in a cask, and when you put liquors in a cask, it will, it will turn darker. It absorbs some of the color and some of the sweetness from the wood in the cask, and you can do that with rum. So, we're going to make a rum and coke. Classic rum drink, very simple. Actually, we're going to make a Cuba Libra. Yeah. Cuba Libra is a rum and coke, just so that you know. The only difference between a Cuba Libra and a regular rum and coke is that a Cuba Libra has a lime wedge as a garnish, automatic. That's what it is. Cooper, why don't you come on up and make a rum coke? All right. <laughs> Great, I make this all the time. I'm looking forward to learning this one, right? Great, here. go ahead. Okay. Glassware so first. Grab the glassware and scoop of ice all the way to the top, right? Yep. Okay. Terrific. And Christy rum. 10 o'clock? Yep. Three count? Yep. Very nice. All right. Now, what I want you to do, though, is when you make these drinks, get in the habit of making them, leaving them on the mat so you don't drop them when you splash liquor all over your fingers. You top it up with Coke. Okay. And now Lounge. the key, right, that most oh, people aren't going to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to uh, mix it. Right, make tin, sure you right? roll it in the tin. Roll it in the tin. Just once? Yep, that'll do it. The carbonation in the drink will go ahead and mix the, the drink for you. I missed the mat there. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, lime wedge, right? Yep. And don't forget your stir. Stir. Anything with two or more ingredients gets at least a stir. Great. Nice job. Good. Good job. Tequila. Anybody have tequila horror stories? <laughs> no. Tequila gets you really drunk, right? What? Tequila is just the same as all the other alcohols. Same proof, same amount of alcohol. What is the purpose of having the worm in the The worm? I was hoping someone was going to ask you about the worm. There is no worm in tequila. Worms are actually in mezcal, which is another liquor from Mexico. And it is actually distilled from the same plant, which is the agave plant. It's a cactus-like plant related to the lily. They have a lot of them in Mexico. Same way they had a lot of sugar canes in the Caribbean. That's what they fermented and distilled to make their liquor. Again, history of liquor, history of mankind. So tequila, you take the agave cactus, mash it up, ferment it, distill it. You end up with white tequila. If you age it, you end up with gold tequila. The worm is in mezcal, and it's not a worm. It's the larval fo form of a moth that lives on the agave plant. Is it edible? It is edible. It is edible. Now, why is it some people have more horror stories when it comes to te tequila versus maybe a, a rum nightmare or a gin or kind That's of a good question. <laughs> tequila is a little different in that tequila has a very strong nose, and your smell is one of the strongest memory triggers that we have. I don't know if you've ever experienced smelling an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend's perfume and it takes you right back to them. Smells a very, very strong memory trigger. So if you have a bad night with a drink or a food that has a very, very strong aroma associated with it, chances are as soon as you smell it again, you're going to go right back to that night. That's really the worst part of tequila. Most liquors are, as I said, served at 80 proof or 40% alcohol. Tequila is just like the rest of them. Okay, so what's the classic tequila drink? Margarita. Margarita? Yeah, margarita. Let's make a margarita. Who wants to make a margarita? Celine, come on up. All right. Chrissy, will you get her a mixed glass? Great. So go ahead and set that up. And a margarita has tequila, triple sec, lime juice, and sour mix. Standard recipe for a margarita. So go ahead and give me a full glass of ice. Wonderful. For a margarita, I want you to give me one ounce of tequila. So just a two count of tequila. And again, remember your counts are going to vary depending on your pour spouts. I think that was a little light. 
Yeah. Why don't you hit it again? <laughs> In one second. One second will work. Good. <laughs> okay, let's find the triple sec. Give me a half ounce of triple sec. Now, what Celine is doing is very, very typical. She's pouring very tentatively. And when you pour tentatively, you have no idea how fast that's oh. going to come out. One, two is much different from one, two. Ten so, 10 o'clock, please. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Great. <laughs> now right. give me a one count of lime juice. That was about 8.30, but close enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Christy, let's take some sour mix to the top. Why don't you give us some sour mix? Now with a margarita, I don't want you to fill it all the way up. Even though I told you I want you to fill all your drinks all the way up, fill it to about a quarter of an inch of the rim, and I'll show you why. Okay, go ahead and put that in the tin, and now I want you to shake this drink, because people like margaritas frothy. Generally drinks with juice, go ahead and shake, makes them taste a lot better. Now you don't necessarily need to shake it until it frosts, but I want you to shake it up real good. Good job. You can stop and put the tin down. Now I want you to rim that glass over here. Turn it upside down, put in your lime juice, and then put it in your salt. Perfect. That's all you need. <laughs> totally perfect. Another misconception with margaritas is that you want a lot of salt. A real margarita doesn't have a lot of salt. You don't want it to overpower the flavor of the drink. Go ahead and set that down. And now I want you to pour that into the margarita glass. Good job. Turn it upside down so it drains. Oh, yeah. Always. And nice and gently in the middle. See that froth? That's going to take it right to the top. Okay. Very nice. Nice work. Now I want a lime and a stir. The side? Right on the side. And that is margarita. All right. Take that back to the table. With me. Now we're going to talk about scotch. And Dave, I think this is what you've been waiting for. Exactly. Exactly. Let's look at some scotches. Let's talk about your standard blended scotch. Obviously, it comes from Scotland. That's where the name comes from. Scotches are fermented from a mash. And it's usually a barley mash. It may have other grains in it. In America, we've taken scotch and turned it into bourbon. And bourbon is mostly corn, made from a corn mash. However you make it, you take a grain, you mash it, you ferment it, you distill it, and then you age it in a cask, usually an oak cask. And again, that's where the color comes from. You end up with scotch. Scotch is a form of whiskey. You have scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, Canadian whiskey, and American whiskey. And into that also you have bourbon, which is a type of American whiskey. All made very, very similarly. Within scotches, you also have single malts and blends. And Dave, you probably heard about this. Yes, I have. And some people have, well, my father-in-law, for example, is only a single malt drinker and he won't touch the blended malt. So I want to find out how these vary on the, uh, the taste of it and the cost. Basically, the difference between single malt scotch and blended scotches, single malt scotches come from a single distillery. And they're generally a single harvest of grain, a single distillery, and they make the scotch. Blended scotches will take scotches from all kinds of different distilleries, 50, maybe 100 different distilleries, and they'll blend them together. Now, the advantage to a blended scotch is that if you have a particular taste profile for your brand of scotch, it's relatively easy to maintain because you can add or subtract different single malt ingredients in order to maintain the overall flavor profile. With a single malt scotch, if it tastes a little different from the way you want it to taste, you better sell it to a blender because your customers aren't going to drink it. It doesn't taste like your scotch. So it's more expensive to produce a single malt scotch generally. Not necessarily a higher quality, although single malt manufacturers may take a little bit more time 
than the blend manufacturers because they know that everything's riding on making that scotch taste exactly right the first time. So that's really the difference. Scotches are always aged. They can be aged up to 25, 30 years. The longer you age them, the more mellow the scotch becomes. The easier it becomes to drink, the more it absorbs character from the cask, the more complex it becomes, and generally people consider it to be better. Plus you have more invested in the scotch, so you're going to charge more for it. You've got to keep it for 25 years. Okay? So, let's make a scotch drink. Let's go ahead and make a whiskey sour. Tiffany, you want to make a whiskey sour? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start with a mixed glass. Thank you. Terrific. And ice. All the way to the top. Let's go ahead and make it with uh, some bourbon. Christy, good three count. Make sure you hit that 10 o'clock position. Okay. Boy, you people are all early. That was a little, <laughs> a little light. A little more. Give me about, more. Yeah, about 15 more minutes. Go ahead. 15 more minutes. <laughs> good. Fabulous. Okay. Next thing I want you to put in there is sour mix. And I don't want you to fill it all the way to the top because we're going to make it a little special. One. Take it to about a half inch below the top. And now we're going to do what's called a splash, and I want you to do just a splash of orange juice. Okay. Whenever you make sours, go ahead and put a splash of orange juice a little below the top because you're going to shake it and it's going to foam up. Great. Tin. There's a type of sour called a stone sour, and a stone sour is half sour mix, half orange juice. It's a little sweeter. I don't necessarily like sour to be stone sour because I do like them to have that sour bite, but a splash of orange juice will cut the sourness. So I usually put just a little bit in. Go ahead and put it in the glass. Great. And again, if you notice, she poured it just under the rim, but once she shakes it, the foam takes it right up to the top. Now, the, the garnish on a sour traditionally is what's called a flag, which is an orange and a cherry, and Christy's going to make one for you. Terrific. Go ahead and pop that in the drink. And you are all set. That Add a stir good. on that and it's done. Wonderful. Why don't you take that back? Well done. Yeah. Okay, next drink we're going to make is a Manhattan, another type of martini drink. And I want to talk to you a little bit about martinis because there's a bunch of them out there and you need to know about the martini family of drinks. First one is a martini. We've already made two, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about them. The original martini was actually not the recipe that I just gave you. The original martini was a vermouth drink. It was mostly vermouth with a little bit of gin added to dry it out. And it was gin, make no mistake. A real martini is gin and vermouth. And the juniper of the gin and the nuttiness of the vermouth combined to make the flavor of the drink that everybody loved. Now today, far and away, we sell more vodka martinis than anything else. So if you go in and order what I call an uncalled martini, you just say, give me a martini, it will probably make you a vodka martini. If you haven't had a gin martini, trust me, try one, they're terrific. Over the years, martinis have gotten drier and drier and drier, in part because it's really cool to say, give me a martini and make it dry. So now your standard, <laughs> that's the truth, James Bond, right? The standard martini now is mostly gin or vodka with a little bit of vermouth, which is how we made them. So that's your martini and you put olives in it. So if I take the same drink and instead of olives, I add cocktail onions, what do we call that? Gibson. A Gibson. That's all it is. The same way a Cuba Libra was just a rum and coke with lime, a Gibson is just a martini where they use cocktail onions as a garnish instead of olives. Now, expanding that out, we also made a Gimlet. And a Gimlet was basically a martini, but instead of vermouth, rather, what did we use? Lime juice. Lime juice, and we garnished it with a lime wedge. Expanding it out even further now, we're going to make a martini-type drink, but we're going to make it with bourbon. And because bourbon is a dark liquor, which they're generally sweeter than your white liquors because of the cask aging, they get a lot of that good flavor from the wood, 
We're going to make it with sweet vermouth instead of with dry vermouth. So, same recipe in proportions as a martini. I'm going to use an ounce and a half of bourbon and a half ounce of sweet vermouth, and the garnish is going to be cherries because it's more appropriate to the sweet taste of the drink. Before we make that, though, I want to talk about one more that everybody knows called the Cosmopolitan, right? One of the most popular drinks out there. Cosmopolitan actually took a non-martini drink and served it in a martini glass, and people refer to it now as a martini. Vodka, lime juice, and a splash of cranberry. That's the classic Cosmopolitan recipe. Sounds very similar to another drink that I think we mentioned earlier, one of the first mixed drinks we talked about with vodka and cranberry, which was what? The Cape Cod. The Cape Cod, which is also served the garnish on a Cape Cod. Lime. Lime. So, if I take a Cape Cod, which is vodka cranberry with a slice of lime, and I just use more vodka and less cranberry and put it in one of these glasses, suddenly I have a cosmopolitan. That's now the trend for a lot of the martinis. So a lot of the martinis that you will go out and buy really don't have anything to do with martinis. They're really just mixed drinks. They make them stronger. They serve them in a martini glass. And they charge you more for them. <laughs> Who wants to come up and make a Manhattan? Uh, Come on! I, I was gonna we'll escape. Do it. I just served the drinks. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Get up there. All right. All right. Now I know you're a career server, so I'm not gonna help you through this too oh, much. Oh, fantastic! Thank you very much. Go ahead and make me a Manhattan. I'll just do a running commentary. Good. Nice big scoop of ice. Make sure you always use enough ice in the tin. If you're having a problem getting the drink to frost, and a lot of people do, it's only one of two things. One, you didn't put enough ice in the tin. Two, you're not shaking hard enough. How does this count, Christy? It's a little Please light. Please say yes. A little Please light. Say a little light. <laughs> Please say good. I'm trying to impress these people. And sweet vermouth, the one with the red top. There you can always go. tell sweet vermouth because it has a red top. Dry vermouth has a green top. Try not to look angry while I say. That's good. <laughs> Nice pour, Justin. Oh, right. yeah. nice. Good job. Do Couple my best. cherries you. and you're all set. Now cherries, I've seen them on picks and I've seen them in the bottom. Which I always put garnishes on picks. I can't stand sticking my finger in drinks, especially if I paid $10 for it. <laughs> I want to keep my hands clean. I want to keep my fingers out of the drink. That's beautiful. Perfect. Why don't you take that back to the table? Well done. Good job. <laughs>
what's the difference between dark and light beer? Dark and light beer. Well, beer is a whole other series by itself. Here's what I want you to know about beer. Um, to answer your question, first of all, it has to do with the roast of the malt. When they actually take the barley that they're going to mash and ferment the beer from, you can roast it just like coffee, and you can have light roast and dark roast. And if you, dark, if you have a dark roast, you're going to caramelize the sugars, and you're going to make the resulting beer darker and sweeter. You don't really need to know all that to go into a bar. You just need to try a couple and know what you like, and again, order what you like. What you do need to know about beer is two things. One, how to pour it, and two, the temperature it needs to be served at. That's the most common mistakes that I see. When you pour a beer, make sure you have head on the beer. And head is just the foam that comes up when you're pouring the beer. You don't want too much because you won't get enough liquid in the glass, but you don't want a flat beer. You want at least a half inch of head. Can anybody tell me why, after all we've been talking about tonight, you would want that head on the beer? For the nose. For the nose, exactly. 99% of what you have ever tasted in your life, you've actually smelled. So the head releases the aroma of the beer. It allows you to start enjoying the beer before you actually taste it. It also decarbonates the beer a little bit and makes it settle a little bit more easily. Second thing I need you to know about beer is the temperature. Who keeps frosted mugs at home? Throw them away, or at least take them out of your freezer. No good. Beer reps don't even like them. Most bars are moving away from frosted mugs. First of all, the beer is much too cold. If it's too cold, it's going to numb your tongue. You're not going to taste it. Second of all, it's going to freeze the water in the beer, and that's going to change the ratio of alcohol and flavor in the beer from what the brewmaster wanted because it's pulling water out of the beer. Okay, so it's actually changing the taste of the beer. You don't want to drink beer out of frosted mugs. You want beer chilled to about 40 degrees for most domestic beers and lighter beers, maybe a little bit warmer than that, 50 or 60 degrees, and this is Fahrenheit for your darker beers. So that's all you need to know, head and temperature. I once ordered a non-alcoholic beer from behind the bar in a lineup of bottles, and I didn't mean to. The bartender made fun of me, so what, what's a non-alcoholic beer? I mean, how can you make a beer without alcohol? That's a great question. <laughs> Non-alcoholic beers um, are not. Non-alcoholic beers have alcohol in them. They don't have much alcohol in them, but it's not possible to brew a beer that doesn't have alcohol in it. They have a lot of it removed, but there's still trace amounts of alcohol in it. That's why it's illegal to serve a non-alcoholic beer to someone who's under the legal drinking age. So you, they will card you for non-alcoholic beers. Well, a lot of times if um, I go to a restaurant and I order a steak, the waiter or the waitress usually asks me how I want it. Um, is it sort of the responsibility of the bartender to ask, well, how do you want your scotch? What you need to be aware of is what does the bartender need to know in order to make the drink properly? And it needs to get to the point where it's second nature. I'm sure, as I said, none of you would order a steak without telling them how you want that steak cooked. And it's the same thing with drinks. My father-in-law would kill me if I filled a rocks glass full of ice and then put in his Glenfiddich in there. Uh, is there a standard as to how much ice you would put in a rocks glass? When you order drinks in rocks glasses, traditionally you want to let the bartender know that you either want what's called light rocks or full rocks. Your father-in-law obviously knows the scotch, and that's the way I actually drink scotch is with what's called light rocks. So I, don't, I would only put about three or four ice cubes in this, and that's so that you don't dilute the scotch too much. A lot of folks like it ice cold and want it a little bit more diluted, so you would order it with full rounds. Celine? Okay, if you ask for a martini dry, does that mean there's going to be more vodka in it, or are you just going to have less in your glass? And let's talk about dirty martinis as well. So if the bar pours a two-ounce martini, and you ask for an extra dry martini, you're going to get two ounces of gin or vodka. If you ask for a regular martini, you'll probably get an ounce and a half of gin or vodka and a half ounce of vermouth. If you ask for a dirty martini, you'll probably only get one ounce of vodka, a half ounce of olive juice, and the bartender may or may not use vermouth depending on their particular style. I like dry vermouth in my martinis with olive juice. A lot of people don't. It's a taste thing. So yes, the way you call the martini does affect the final volume of liquor that you get in the drink proportionally. Um, well, do they charge you more because you're nope. getting more? No. 
I uh, once uh, took a drink off the bar before the bartender was finished making it and <laughs> got yelled at. So is, is there a way I should know that when he's finished, is there, is there a sign? When the drink is ready to be served, they should put a cocktail napkin in front of you and place the drink on the cocktail napkin. Okay, folks. So we've talked a lot about what is behind a bar, what the ingredients are, how you mix them properly. We've made a couple drinks. We've only really scratched the surface. We can talk a lot about beer. We can talk about wine. We can talk a lot more in depth about all of the things that we touched on tonight. But hopefully we got a good basis to start, go home, and start practicing some of these techniques so we get good at them. Yeah. I hope you all learned something tonight. Yeah. 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 Tell me some stuff. What did we learn? What did we learn? Fill the glass all the way with ice. Fill the glass all the way with ice. Very important. Uh, study of alcohol is a study of the history of man. Exactly. exactly. On the rocks means with ice. On the rocks <laughs> means with ice. Pour at 10 Great. o'clock. Pour at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Very good. You know, I learned a lot, but I got to be honest, it's, it doesn't even start to scratch the surface of everything that yeah. I've encountered alcohol wise at the table. We get to go into more as we get on other classes. We, we have, have, yep, we have plenty more classes coming up. So please keep an eye out when you see them. Come join us, folks at home. Keep an eye out for the videos. We'll be able to cover a lot more in the upcoming classes. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yay.